first one is Eric from Blockland. Uh, welcome. Sure. You've been here before. Sorry? <laughs> You've been here before, I, I said. I've been here before. And then I talked about Wolf and yeah. uh, responsive fonts. Right. Uh, that's, okay. that's one thing that he brought to us, Wolf. But he did many other interesting things. I think your whole life is filled with type design and coding, like the in-betweens of both. Uh, you created things like Beowulf when many in these audience weren't even born, I think. Uh, Thank you. I thought, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Didn't want to make you feel old. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, many different, uh, many many interesting things about you today. It's going to be a little bit different and uh, a little different topic than we're normally used from you. But right. I'm well, we try. very much interested in what you're going to tell us. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, for sitting through. Um, the only reason I'm here is really I wanted to see Dennis and Jerry talk, so um, you have to sit through my talk. Um, I'm a type designer, and I teach at the Royal Academy in The Hague uh, at the Type and Media course. And as such, I have to answer difficult questions about, well, how, do, how does it work? Of course, the students don't ask these questions. They just want to use RoboFont and, and Glyphs and FontLab. Um, I end up asking these questions because um, I cannot help being interested in how these things work. And then as an amateur scientist and an avid reader of Wikipedia, I sort of try to dig in. So our eyes see light. Yes, obvious. OK. Um, there's a big sun. There's a big sun in the middle of our solar system. Um, light takes about eight and a half minutes to get from the sun to here. So that's nice. It's sort of fresh, fresh energy when you look at the sun. Uh, the photon that actually comes to the surface of the sun takes between 50,000 and 100,000 years to get from the center of the sun to the edge of the sun. Did you know? It's really old. Anyway, it's not really important. Uh, we see light. We see, we only respond to energy hitting our eyes. We don't really respond to n no energy hitting our eyes. You, you, your brain makes up that it's dark. Uh, you, because your eyes really respond to light. You see the light. You don't. You imagine the dark, but your eyes respond to the light. So light is nice. Light is interesting. Let's have a look at light. Uh, some fun with optics. So you've you've seen, or well, this really should be called pictures of snow. Uh, we've seen, and I might be treading on people's toes. I'm sorry. Uh, pictures like on the left, uh, an article on the legibility, the improved legibility of a typeface from uh, Gerard Unger. And we've seen them where they get blurred and you see, look, the top one is more legible than the bottom one. And I got really interesting, yes, blur, okay, why? Why is it blurred? What, what part is blurred? Is it not focused? People not wearing their glasses? How much blur is there? Why uh, is, so I started getting into this figuring out why so many people, so many type designers use samples like this to show that you know, you blur the typeface, it's better. It happens here, and I'm sure it's all, now, uh, up to a point it makes sense, but, oh man, really. So, um, this is the first time when it, uh, I can actually read this uh, web page. Uh, the fonts are beautiful, they're well hinted, they're nicely designed, but when I opened this up on my screen on my computer uh, two days ago, I was squinting and getting closer and squinting again. So they're beautiful, they're well done, it's all very even, but it's too bloody small. So with all of the, all of the effort and all of the time that people spend, you know, should this be half a pixel, pixel and a half, where, where is this column going to go, With which shade of blue are we using? It's all very important, but <laughs> it's, it's failing the main thing. I cannot read it, and I'm not, I'm not old, I'm not handicapped, I wear glasses, but... <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm right in the middle of the bell curve. I'm may maybe not uh, a 22-year-old uh, interface designer working for Apple, but still, you know, it works. My eyes work. I cannot read it. Something is wrong. So how does the eye work? Uh, our, our wise master, Gerrit Nordse, who we are not allowed to question on anything, uh, in his book, uh, The Hands of the Seven Sisters, uh, made this drawing, uh, explaining that besides distance and, and focus and needing glasses, uh, there's a process called diffraction, which happens on the edges of the letters. So this was an interesting uh, little drawing. I called him up, asked him about it. He mumbled. I was a little bit grumpy. But now this, this thing called diffraction, 
what is going on? It's interesting because it affects the way that we look at letters. It happens in our eyes. So as type designers and topographers, it helps to be aware of what that is, right? So uh, we mentioned the sun. If you put the sun really far away, it becomes a star. It's a little dot. You look at the stars at night. Can you see the stars here in Munich, or are there too many lights? I guess, all right. It's an actual dot. Uh, but while you look at it, you kind of think, oh, it's a little disk. It's a little circle of light. You're not looking at the side of a, of a star. You're not looking at the edge of a star. Like you're looking at the sun, you see a circle. You look at the moon, you see a circle. When you look at a star, you see a little circle, but it's not the side of a star. That's the diffraction. That's the, the physical properties of your eye breaking this light into a little circle. So that's, that's sort of a, a, a minimum resolution that your eye has. Uh, it was named after uh, an English astronomer, George Biddle Airy, who apparently also was really against Darwin. So maybe how, how far that goes. But um, he uh, figured out that any kind of an optical system, a camera, a microscope, a telescope, uh, your eye has a maximum resolution. Just because the lens is made out of matter, the light has to go through, it's scattering through all of these atoms, it's doing stuff, it ends up in your eye, on, on your retina. Um, it's not very good. So here's a rather rather grumpy picture of an eye. I guess the person looking at it wasn't very happy. Uh, here's a, a section of the eye, also not looking very happy, but you've seen this. Um, people refer to this, this slide as the Frankenstein slide. I don't know, this is an eye, we all have several. You know. um, light comes in, there's your cornea, then there's a bit of soup, there's your, your colorful iris, uh, there's a lens, there's more soup, and then there's, there's a retina, which is this, this thin layer of nerves and, and uh, of ovial cones, these things that actually respond to the light. And what I've tried to do with this beautiful illustration is that every time this, this light goes from one medium to another, so from, say, air to uh, uh, ham, no, it's ham first and then it's soup, um, or from soup to, to lens and then from lens to soup, every time it goes from one, one medium to another, it breaks a little bit. So it, when light interacts with matter, it does really interesting things, especially when the matter is, is transparent. It's crazy. So. Uh, what starts as a single point at the top becomes you now a cute little blurry disc at the bottom. All right, fine. Here's here's your lens. You didn't you know it did look like that. Um, I didn't. You think of lenses as you know things you see in your glasses. They're beautiful. They're 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 optical. They're glass. They're all awesome. But this is made out of out of cells and 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 tissue and uh, maybe even blood vessels. Who God knows what is was in there. Um, so these things scatter, it makes it bigger. So why are we not constantly worried about this being blurry and this, uh, you know, why are we not aware of this? It's because we've never seen anything else. We are completely at ease. Uh, why can you not read my phone or why can you re not read this book at the end of the room? Can you try reading this text here? It's because we know we can't, we, it's quite okay. We'll just walk closer. You know, and if it's our phone, we'll hold it like that. If you can't really see it, and we'll do our best. We're used. We're used to it. Oh yeah, uh, the retina. <laughs> so light comes in from the top, right? So this is the this is the part that faces the lens, and then this is the part that sort of faces your brain. Uh, there's some scattering going on here, but the interesting thing here is that the nerves are at the top, and then the bits that actually respond to light are at the bottom. So you're seeing through your nerves. So imagine holding up uh, oh, uh, some ham <laughs> and seeing through the ham. So look, that's wonderful. That's what's going on, and you're not aware of the ham because you've been watching, seeing through the ham. But you know, if if you're designing eyes, suppose you know, you're really into the creator thing. If you're designing eyes, why not put the nerves at the back, right, rather than at the front? It doesn't make any sense. Squids have nerves at the other end, and their eyes are better. Go figure. All right, so that doesn't promise much, right? Uh, the light is scattering, it gets fuzzy, it gets blurry, we're looking through a ham. Um, what, what does that mean? So, um, Mr. There's uh, a guy from uh, uh, Berkeley made some really interesting pictures. Uh, this is, um, no, it's, it's simulated, but the U and the H here at 2020 vision, that's the American way of saying that you can see 
good enough to drive a car. Uh, it's it's kind of small. It's roughly like five point. Um, this is what you think you see, but this is roughly a simulation of what ends up on your retina. If you can tell, that's not very much. This is for a healthy eye with a normal, no disease, nothing, no glasses. That's roughly sort of how blurry it is when it ends up on your retina. So the fact that there's nerves there making signals, there's your brain going, oh, I know what this is. It's a, it's a white UNH or it's a black UNH on five points on this page. All of that, anything between this and you thinking that you're looking at five point type on a page is, is your brain making this stuff up, right? It's your brain creating this reality of what you're looking at. Um, I show this to my type design students and say, look, what is important? The weight, uh, uh, the balance of, of uh, black and white, the, the spacing, uh, the proportion, that cute little kink in the counter that you've worked on so hard, not so much. It will, it will show up on the front of your specimen book, but not anywhere else. So, this whole airy disk thing, uh, I started reading more about it. Um, the diffraction is not the only thing that, that helps or, or sort of influences the way that you see. Um, the fact that it's not perfectly round, it's not perfect in any sense, uh, you, you might also need glasses. So all of this stuff contributes to the fact that the light is getting bigger and bigger and blurrier and blurrier. There's also a connection between the, the radius of this blur and your pupil, which kind of counterintuitively, counterintuitively means that if your pupil is getting bigger, the influence of at least of the airy disk will be less, and if your pupil is smaller, the influence will be bigger. But we're talking to you know, between a half and two and a half arc minutes. Oh dear, arc minutes, science. <laughs> I give up, I'm a designer, I'm too artistic. All right, um, you've heard about circles, right, your designers? Um, usually circles are divided up in degrees. Uh, you get uh, 360 of them. I think we have the Babylonians to thank for this because they thought there were 360 days in a year. Silly Babylonians. Um, you get closer and closer and closer, and at some point, you know, this is one degree. So this is one 360th of a circle. So this will be 180 of them, this will be 80, uh, 90, sorry, this is, um, so this is one of them. And you can tell these then are new subdivisions between uh, in a single degree, and we call them minutes. Just like a clock, but then well, 24 hours or 60, you have sort of have to take the 60 thing, and scientists call these minutes. All right, Eric. So one degree has 60 minutes, right? Okay. Now, you superimpose this, this uh, half arc minute and two and a half arc minutes from the early, earlier thing, you can get a, kind of get an idea of how, how big that is in the big scale of things, not really very much. The blurry part here, I think is wrong. Uh, I think it's too much, actually. So I have to work on that, and I will get told off by actual scientists doing actual work. So here it goes. Um, so if we are seeing blurry things, if we are seeing blur, how can we differentiate? How can we even make out one thing from another? And the thing is, well, we really can't. And also, we really can because our brains are kind of used to dealing with facts that are kind of neither here nor there. So uh, here's one bright line in the middle, and it's kind of blurry. And the white lines are going to go apart. They will become two white lines. And you have to say when they become two lines. Will it work? It'll work. This is, these are two million points. No. Now, no. yeah. Yeah, but where, when? It's not really any fixed moment. It's not two b white rectangles moving apart. It's, it's kind of, you have an opinion. Well, maybe now? Maybe now? I don't know. So people will have different experiences for this. Uh, this is what goes on at the lowest level of your vision. You will, at some point, not be able to tell two small dots apart, two lines apart, and then they become effectively become one. This is not really the same for everybody, but it's roughly in the same area for everybody. So that's why when you go to a glasses store, they can kind of figure out what you need. Now, for type designers, remember, this is all for uh, type design students, so I can, I can tell them whatever I want. It's only when I have to put it in Drawbot and I want to make images, I, I kind of have to test my ideas for, for, with reality. Um, 
So, eight point type at 40 centimeters. If you go to sizecalc.com, this is, I think, another reference to a Nick Sherman website, uh, sizecalc.com is awesome because you can do this, this kind of math. So, eight point at 40 centimeters, which would be, you know, holding a normal book at a normal distance. Um, that means that it's roughly 24 arc minutes. We've seen the arc minutes before, so just accept, right? That's roughly 24. Okay, fine. And then somebody said, well, my arms are shorter. Shut up. All right, so you, can, you have the type here, you have your eye, then you can do the, the little triangle, you know the roughly the diameter of an eyeball, so it gets to be, the image that's uh, projected on your retina, as I calculated, is 0.157 millimeters, which is kind of small. If you calculate the number of, of no, the density of foveal coin, uh, co coins, cones, on your retina, that vertically it would roughly be 80. That doesn't mean that there's exactly 80 uh, 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 cones looking at your, your eight point letter, but it's to give you an indication. It's not millions. It's not thousands. It's even, you know, it's, it's not that much. So first of all, the letter is very small when it gets to your eye. Um, there aren't that many, it's really, really blurry because of the lens in your cornea. And then there aren't that many cells really interested in what you're showing. So the fact that we can read is awesome. Uh, an M unit in, in fonts, uh, you can calculate this size would then be uh, 0.024 arc minutes. Uh, say your X height is 550 M units, you'll get to 13 arc minutes. Sure, Eric, what does that mean? Add the pupil size in the area disc diameter that we had before. Say your pupil size is 8.2 millimeters, so uh, the, the area disc would be 0.65 arc minutes, which means that with an open pupil, uh, the blur that you're dealing with is 27 units in your font window. It's like in your font scale. So you're making details that are less than 27 units. Um, you might not actually see them. Uh, you will see the, the weight, you will see proportion, but you know, actual small little things, smaller than this, uh, are not going to be there, or at least are not going to be there if you, t if you put them at the right size. Uh, one millimeter pupil means that the, uh, the, the, the blur is now at 185 M units. Um, so take your letter, post it in Photoshop, and blur it with this amount, and see what is left. Uh, despair, and then go back and uh, do it again. Uh, so, uh, this is the, um, the Snellen eye chart, uh, invented by some 19th century Dutch eye doctor, Mr. Snellen. Um, always, as a type designer, you have to make comments about how the contrast is wrong here, and the contrast is wrong there, and the stairs are really too fat, and he sticks out, and until, you know, it's taken me, what, 40 years? Maybe 20 years of being a professional type designer to actually look up the Wikipedia page and find out what it's for. Um, it actually makes sense. So, the lines as they are presented at your eye doctor uh, would be one arc minute thick. So you got one, two, three, four, five arc minutes. If you can tell them apart, your, eye are, your eyes have a particular quality. If you can't tell them apart, you know, you're not. Um, so they're really actually quite well designed for the purpose that they're for. In the same scale, eight point at, f at 40 centimeters is then this big. Uh, in my, my beautiful Eames medium, isn't it just awesome? <laughs> So eight point type, eight point type isn't no, it isn't that small. It's actually it's quite reasonable. These are the 24 arc minutes again. So this is kind of how it measures up. Uh, this is kind of how the blur measures up for for normal reading, at least now for the diffraction, as far as I can calculate it, uh, without any focus problems or any other aberrations. And this is a bit of of a simulated, uh, way too straight and organized. Uh, foveal tissue, which of course does not look anything like this, but it's there to give you an idea of the scale. Um, now, th you would only have about four to look at the thin parts. It's not that there are actu actually four of these things looking at the thin parts, but it's to give you an idea of the scale. It's not millions. It's, it's very, very small numbers. Um, so, back to type design. So we know about this little disk. We know that it blurs. We know that it blurs in difficult conditions. How does that interact with um, thicks and thins? So I made some dots. I, I love these dots. Uh, they start at a particular point and then uh, using a simple Gaussian 
uh, function, you can just put them somewhere else. You, you change the diameter, they're either close together or they're really far apart. So you can simulate, the, the position of these dots can sort of simulate what the light does uh, when, it, when it breaks. Um, when they're really close together, you can see there's a difference. This line is twice as thick as that. But when you start blurring, now this is already much less than twice what you see there. So just because the blur is there, are you, f are you still with me? Have you lost, lost you already? Oh, man. You m this means that if you make your type smaller, the thins will become more thin than the thicks. The thicks will stick around, whereas the thins are drowning in this, in this light. So you reduce type, the contrast will become bigger. So it looks like it has bigger contrast. So you want your typeface to have the same contrast. It means that you have to make one where the small sizes have thicker thins. And this is why. And I've always been told that you have to do this. And I knew on an intellectual level, and I've seen the historical samples. And uh, I have uh, Tim's wonderful book, which is excellent. And then you see that it's been done, but now I can explain why, or at least I, I think I do. So now we can visualize stuff. Um, this is a Gaussian distribution. It's not really what the diffraction is, uh, but uh, it, it, for all intents and purposes, it kind of works. And you get these beautiful little, little snowy, uh, snowy things. Now, why am I interested in the snowy things? That took a while to render. All right, this. So we're used to seeing these on our screens. Uh, we all have now 5K IMAX. We're looking at super high resolution of beautiful, rendered, awesome type. And we have no idea what it's going to look like when we make it small. Uh, it's very hard to output type on uh, photographic paper because everything goes straight to offset. So you don't have any output places that do this. Laser printers are no good at this scale, even if you buy a really expensive one. Um, these screens are better, but they're not there. And then you get to the, the Gaussian blur in Photoshop. This is beautiful. Uh, it's really nice. But I don't think it represents what, go in, goes, what goes on. This is what happens when the ink would sort of blur into the milk or into the yogurt or whatever you imagine. Uh, the black goes out and becomes bigger and the white sort of goes in. But there is no black. There is no black light. There's only white light that does stuff. So maybe we can, just, maybe we can see that. And I started making little animations like this, where each dot connects a line between where it actually starts and then where the, uh, uh, the airy disk would then say, where the point spread function would say where it would end up. And you see there's stuff leaking into the thins there, you know, whereas there's not nothing anything le leaking into the, the stems. So I like those things. So I make more and I have more pictures of snow and I want to find a way of, of showing type at small sizes. So I can build this into an interface and put it in front of a type designer who can then use it to prove stuff or at least to draw conclusions. Um, I cannot show it at actual size and actual smallness, uh, but uh, maybe there are ways of indicating what happens. So these ma this mass here, you can tell which letter, di letter this is? Yes? OK, you can all drive home now. So uh, each white dot starts at one point and it ends up where that little blur would say that it would end up. So in a, in a white surface, that is not a problem because everything sort of scatters in all directions and it's fine. But when you get to an artificial boundary, uh, things will start leaking in there. So this one came from there. This one came from there. This one came from there. There's stuff leaking into the stems. The stems get smaller. The white gets bigger. The black gets smaller. And I cannot imagine how the black is leaking out. I mean, this, there must be stuff missing here that was there, but there, there's a, there seems to be an asymmetry in which your eye responds to light. You don't re see or you don't experience the, the absence of something in really bright light, whereas you will see light in really, uh, anyway, never mind. Well, if it's a real scientist, uh, 600,000 dots. Um, the, in this animation, the, the airy disk gets bigger, so they start out really nicely aligned. Uh, they animate from, from the place where they started to the, the place where the, they would end up. So you actually see now when, when the air disk gets bigger, now the thins get attacked first. The thins start leaking away. The nice little italic E, the thins have completely gone. 
as you only see there's a, there's a bit of the uh, the bit of the ticks are left, whereas the slightly thicker type is still there. So if you're making a website, say for a conference on uh, web fonts, <laughs> you don't take type that is too light because when it's too small, you can't actually see it, and this is why because your eyes cannot resolve it. There's nothing there. The black type is still there, but the counter is completely gone. Anyway, and here's one, it's the same one, but now it's the, the, the airy disk diameter is the same. And if you're, if you're really far away, you can still see the E, but kind of close up, it's kind of there. So it, this does not mean that your vision is a soup of, of uh, noodling white dots. Uh, but I'm trying to find ways of, of showing you know, what happens, or, or at least illustrating uh, how you can use this. Onward. Um, optical scale and type founding, uh, a nice article by Harry Carter in 1937, where he says, with the new technology, finally, maybe, now, it's so cheap to make new typefaces, we can actually make optical sizes again. 1937. And of course, now it takes another 50 years, 60 years before people start making optical sizes again. Uh, this is a six point, as the slide says, a six point and a ten point hand cut by Wahlbaum. Justus Erich Wahlbaum, of course. Uh, beautiful typefaces, you look at them close up. They're not so good. I mean, you say, well, you know, we look at them with, with modern eyes, they think of all those curves. I mean, uh, I know potatoes that have better curves, but uh, what, what's going on? Clearly, when he was cutting this and when he was proofing this, those bumps did not make any difference. What will make a difference and why it is a good typeface is that you know, the spacing and the weight and all of that stuff is good. And then these things don't really matter. And he's cutting it from steel, so he's cutting it at the right size, one size. It's good. So if we start, uh, if we know that these things have been cut with uh, uh, human eyes that are also just bound by physical limitations, uh, we can look at existing optical sizes and maybe sort of apply these uh, transformations and then see what they were thinking of or see if they were thinking anything. Um, I don't think the step from this to that is actually that good. I think this is just you know, a cut where they made the thins a little bit thicker. But it's not something that it was really cut for this purpose. Um, so what is, what is this, Eric? Well, it's just a colorful picture with white dots and green lines. At some point, um, I think, you know, if light gets, if, if, if the density is really close, does it start making a difference when, when uh, um, there, there's something going on with you have, you have a small counter, you have small white shape in a heavy bold or a heavy black. Uh, that looks smaller, it looks dimmer than, uh, say, a slightly bigger one. There's, there's something where your eye starts dropping off, where your eye stops paying attention to small white amounts of light and I was trying to figure this out. And I think uh, this is not what goes on, but it was a very pretty picture. And you know, I make this with, uh, with Drawbot. I can recommend uh, Drawbot Science, uh, Drawbot app, you know, drawbot.com, you can download it. You write Python, you can make animations. It's really, really useful to express your ideas in these, in these visual ways. This one is a little bit more useful. Um, imagine, um, this is not the RGB picture from Marco's slide, but it is RGB kind of. Uh, these black blocks. That's sort of a right side of a letter, and this is sort of the left side of a letter, and they're closer and further apart. Uh, the blue stuff is the, um, the, wh the, the white below a letter, and the red stuff is the white below uh, the top of a letter, and the green stuff is the white between the letters. So now we know it scatters. Well, it's not really scattering, but sort of the diffraction makes sure that the, the, the light will go uh, within this disk. Can I stop it at some point? Can I? Um, is there? No. I cannot actually stop the animation. Oh well. But here it is. Now click, yes, do I get controls? Yeah. Alright. No, sorry. I want controls. Oh bollocks. Whatever. It gets closer. These percentages here, this one, um, these percentages here indicate how much light comes from the top, how much light comes from the bottom, for the space in between here. And it's nice to see that um, if the letters get really close, so for a really condensed type, um, a lot of light actually, the, the, the biggest part that contributes to the, the light between the letters comes from above and from below, rather than from in the middle. 
if you want to find out more about how this works, I'll actually explain, because I'm not doing a very good job right now. But all of this is going in this direction, uh, a, a nice postmodern image. Um, I want to have the math to calculate the gray level at any point on a page uh, uh, for any typeface, any position. So, and then for you know, any kind of pupil size and any kind of distance. So you can kind of emulate what goes on and what, how gray something would be here, how gray would be something there. Because that is going to be really nice in uh, the context of some auto spacing or auto kerning or kerning evaluation or spacing evaluation where you can take some points between letters, get the gray value and figure out what goes on. Um, I'm not there yet because uh, some of the math is really uh, hairy and I'm stuck. So if there are any mathematicians here? No. Oh. Um, one more thing in Drawbot. I'm almost done. Uh, this is uh, for uh, a recent project. We know about different screens, we know about different resolutions, uh, and the different distances that they get used at. And this is a little diagram. So this, there's, there's my eye. Uh, and then within distances, how far you would use them. Um, uh, it's dynamic. It's a little Drawbot thing. Um, you can slide these things. So an iPhone here, an iPhone there, an iPad here, an iPad there, an iPad across the room, a TV on the wall, TV slightly closer. You can move this stuff around and uh, see what, uh, how, what the angular size is. So the phone here would be that big, the phone there would be only that big. So you can do these calculations. The, the numbers here at the top uh, involve the resolution. So a really high resolution iPad, you would need really big type to render at the same size. So all of these, HPX, all of these render at the same size. Uh, a stupid, lousy old television, 27 pixels, I, uh, iPhone really close up, 117 pixels, they would render at the same size. So they would render at the same size, sorry, they would appear to be the same size. Um, and there's almost nothing, you, you cannot hint against that. You cannot. So you have to work with, you, know, you have to design typefaces maybe in grades, in levels, uh, to actually fit those different screens. And this is what we're doing for um, you know, actual projects, actual clients. Um, it's useful. And if I've stunned you enough, uh, here's one more link to Drawbot because it's really nice. And uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you.